There we go. All of our sessions in our official classes are recorded, the reason being that we want you to be able to go back and make up any work that you might miss, and also just have them available in case a few weeks after a lecture you say to yourselves, hey, I really wish I'd paid more attention to a certain topic, or even, hey, I knew it then, I really felt strong about it that night, but now I feel like I've forgotten it. We'll be able to go back and rewatch any lectures that you'd like. All right, so like I was saying, we've got a good distribution here. A few people that have taken the test already. Uh, the, uh, a few people that have taken practice tests, and most of you have cracked the book. We've only got one person who is completely tabula rasa, who has no GRE experience yet, and that's fine. Max, that recording can be found in a number of different places. The most interesting one, I think, is that a lot of these uh, free GRE sessions will end up on our Manhattan Prep YouTube channel. You may also have access to them through Blackboard. Zach, I'm going to uh, uh, fall back on you here. You can let me know if that's correct for these free GRE prep hours. For our paid content, I know you'd have access to them through uh, Blackboard. But I know that you'll be able to find this and other free prep hours eventually on YouTube as well. All right. One quick note about the problems that we're going to be looking at here this evening. The problems that we're going to be looking at are taken from a book called The Five Pound Book of GRE Practice Problems. It's one that we publish at Manhattan Prep. Uh, a bunch of our instructors have spent a ton of time generating this book that is quite literally five pounds of GRE practice problems. It's actually the only one of our books to crack Amazon's top 100 books, uh, top 100 bestseller list. Not top 100 textbooks, but just top 100 books in general. So we're pretty proud of that fact. Uh, you can find this in bookstores, but you're not going to need it here for tonight. Uh, for tonight, any problems that we're going to be doing, I'm going to have posted right up on the screen for you. Okay, so it looks like some people are typing. I'm going to hang on just a second. Max or Kathy, did you have questions? Ah, gotcha. Okay. And sometimes those chat bubbles will pop up uh, unnecessarily. Uh, Blackboard can be a little glitchy sometimes. It's usually pretty solid, but a little glitchy with those uh, chat bubbles. Okay. So, very quickly, tonight, the problem type that I want to focus on is the most unique question type in the quantitative section. I want to look at quantitative comparisons. How familiar are you guys with quantitative comparisons already? On a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is, I have no idea how to solve these problems, and 10 is, yep, I am completely comfortable with these. How do you feel about these problems? Tell me in the chat. Oh, interesting. I see some tens. I always love the challenge of tens. Tens, as soon as I see that, I immediately go, hmm, how hard of a problem can I throw at them? Hmm. Um, so that's fantastic. But we do have a little bit of a range here. So before we get into some actual problems, I want to talk a little bit about the structure of quantitative comparisons. In a quantitative comparison problem, you are always going to have two quantities, quantity A and quantity B. Sometimes, but not always, you will also get some shared information that's true for quantity A as well as for quantity B. Your job as a test taker when you see one of these problems is to decide which is greater. Is it quantity A? Is it quantity B? Are the two quantities equal, or, most interestingly, can the relationship not be determined from the information given? <clears throat> Excuse me. So very quickly, don't hit send yet. Do not hit send, no spoilers. But please go ahead and type into the chat window for me. What would be the correct answer? if you solve this problem on the actual GRE. 
Ah, no spoilers, no spoilers. All right, go ahead, hit send. Let's see what you got. Yeah, of course, it's going to be answer choice B. We take two, we plug it in here, and we know that five is going to be greater than four. Absolutely, answer choice B is correct. Now, what if, what if, what if I did this? Same drill. Don't hit send yet. No spoilers. Don't hit send yet. But type into the chat for me. What would be the answer now? Nah, no spoilers. Okay, send them over. Let's see what you got. Excellent. Yep, of course. Now that X could be anything, we don't know. Maybe the correct answer is that they're equal. Maybe quantity A is greater. Maybe quantity B is greater. We don't know, so the answer we choose is B. Excellent. You guys clearly seem pretty comfortable with that. If you feel comfortable with the basic mechanics of quantitative comparison, just give me a quick plus one in the chat there. Wonderful. Then I do not want to spend any more time on that. Instead, I want to switch gears, and I want to have you guys actually try a couple problems. I'm just going to throw you into these ones without any kind of background, but then afterwards, we're going to talk a little bit about how you solve these, and we're also going to talk about not just how you get them right, but how you get them right as efficiently as possible. I got two problems for you here. I will give you, I'll give you three minutes on the clock to try to solve both of them. And when you think you have your answers, I want you to go ahead and send them over to me in the private chat. I'm turning it now so that all of the chat will be private. So when you think you have answers to both of them, send them both over to me together. All right, I see a couple chat bubbles still out there. If you think you have some answers, go on ahead and send them over to me, even if you're not finished entirely, because I want to get moving on here a little bit. Okay, so let's talk. I'm going to come back to these. Trust me on this. I'm coming back to these. Well, I want to talk a little bit first about what we're going to cover here tonight. I want to talk a little bit about the test methods and how kind of understanding what they're trying to do and to a little bit of an extent the kind of people that they are can help us in, help inform us as to how we can try to solve problems like the ones that we just looked at. So we're going to be talking about why anybody would ever want to write test questions. What could possibly be enjoyable about that? I'm going to talk about how that can help us to solve these problems. And then I'm going to give you my best piece of advice for those last two problems. My best piece of advice for solving those last two problems is to cheat. Sort of. Not really, but sort of. Okay, so first things first, let's talk about the test makers. When we talk about the test makers in the full class, by the way, has anybody taken, I'm going to set the chat back to public. Please go ahead and come on back to the main room if you haven't done so yet. Has anyone taken a Manhattan uh, prep class already? If you have, just give me a quick plus one in the chat there. Oh, wonderful. Wow. Okay, a bunch of you have actually done and not just a free 
uh, a free prep hour like this, but you've actually done a full course. Is that correct? Okay, so for some of you, yes, for some of you, no. Okay, very interesting. Okay, so for some of you that have done the full course already, we're going to talk about a concept tonight that you should be a little bit familiar with already. By the way, I'm curious. Catherine, not to put you too much on the spot here. It's totally fine if this doesn't jump out at you right away. But is there a strategy that you remember from the full course that you would use to solve these problems? Very good, Catherine. Nicely done. We're going to talk a little bit more about the mechanics of that and how it works, but absolutely that's what I was getting at. Now, for Catherine and anybody else who's taken the full course, you're already familiar with this lady right here. This is actually Ethel Martin, who was an early computer programmer. But in the context of the GRE classes, we use her as kind of our uh, personification of all of the test makers. A little weird to say that because they're actually people, but still, she's going to be almost our scapegoat here. You can imagine that the people writing this test are in a room somewhere, turning knobs and flipping switches and writing questions that are designed to give you a hard time. So what's in it for them? I mean, yeah, it's a paycheck, but what do you think makes this interesting for them? That's true. That's what the test is designed to do, and I'm sure that they like doing that, absolutely. Yeah, and there's that, the whole point of uh, standardization, which is great. Um, ha -ha. Now we're getting into kind of the malicious side of things with Max and Sabrina's answers. That idea of tricking or trying to trick the test taker and stressing students out. Yeah. That's certainly one of their goals. I, I don't want to be so cynical as to say that's the reason they're doing it. I certainly hope that the test makers down at ETS are not a bunch of folks who are all just going, <laughs> I can't wait to stress everybody out with these horrible questions. <laughs> however, however, certainly that is part of what they're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, that's part of their goal, no doubt about it. I would say that the positive spin on that is that the people who are drawn to writing these questions are usually the kind of people who like making games. They like making games. They like making puzzles. Um, and that's what the GRE really is. It's really a test of your logic. It's really a collection of logic puzzles that look like math problems. Yes, they're going to be setting traps. Absolutely. Because a puzzle is no fun if it's not a little bit challenging. But the other side of a puzzle is they're also going to give you clues. So, and Catherine, I'm going to ask you and anybody else who's taken the full class already to hold off just a little bit on this next slide. For those of you who have not taken a full course with us before, take a look back at these two problems. Where in them can you find clues that you can use to help solve them? Let's do it this way. I want to change the way I've asked that question a little bit. What I'm going to ask you guys to do is grab the highlighter. The way you do that, if you're not familiar, is using this toolbar. I'm seeing a picture of right on the screen here. There we go. If you click on the pencil right here and then click on the tool right next to it, that's the highlighter. And what I want you to do is define that highlighter. And when you found it, go ahead and just draw a check mark in the box that I've drawn on the screen. I put one there myself. Good, 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 good. Now, do me a favor, though. Pick some color besides yellow. If we're all using yellow, it's going to get real ugly and real hard to read real fast. So go ahead and pick blue or pink or green when you have, oh, good, there we go, there's purple. Just go ahead and draw another check mark in the box for me here.
Fantastic. All right. Wonderful. Then, let me ask this question again. With those highlighters, go ahead and find me some of the clues that Ethel and the test makers have left for you in these problems. Ah, at the very end here, someone found my favorite clue. Let me t give you another example of a couple of problems here. Oh, yeah, Kathy, that's correct. Unfortunately, those of you on mobile won't be able to access the, the highlighter. You are right about that. What's different between these two problems? Well, they both have some shared information here. That's pretty similar. And they both have some kind of an unknown quantity in quantity A. The big difference, and somebody kind of hit on it right here, is that in this problem, quantity B is actually a number. Now, I can tell you right now, the test makers do not do anything by chance. There absolutely is not a problem where they just picked a number randomly and threw it in there for quantity B. If they have given you a number in quantity B, believe it or not, that's part of how you can solve this problem. That is one of the clues they've left you, and a lot of the times it's going to be one of the most important clues that they've left you. So this is something I want you guys to start noticing. As you're doing your problem sets from here on out, as you're doing your practice tests, as you're doing your practice problems from whatever book you're working from, start to pay attention to the times when quantity B is a number. Okay, let's talk about these problems. By the way, Francisco, I would uh, – agree with you to some extent for the second one here, and that's a good insight. Because there is an actual average that we could calculate, you're right that this can't be D. That's not related to the fact that quantity B is a number alone, but it's because quantity B is a number, and this is something we could calculate. It's a really good insight there. Okay, so let's take a look at how we do it. Let's take a look at how we do it. In order to cheat off of B, we have to consider a couple different possibilities. We have to consider what if quantity B and quantity A were equal. Before we dive too far into this, I'd like to get everybody's answers for this one. So do me a favor, go ahead and poll in for me. Not the chat, but use the poll, please. A, B, C, or D. What answer did you give me for this first problem? All right, good. I got a lot of answer choice B's, I got a couple of C's, I got a couple of A's. Okay? Let's talk about it. Um, I want to call on somebody here, and I'm, I'm going to be nice on this one. I'm not going to cold call on anybody. Who feels confident about how they solved this problem? If you feel confident about the way you did it, give me a quick plus one in the chat there. <laughs> I see some chat bubbles, but I haven't actually gotten a plus one yet. I think a lot of people are uh, 
double checking their answers. Kathy, you were the first one. Grab the microphone for me. Talk me through how you solved this problem. Ooh, does your tablet have a mic, Kathy? Ah, shoot. I know that it is on the iPhone version. Oh, maybe you're right about that on the iPad. Oh, that's too bad. That's okay. Um, Caesar, Caesar, would you do me a favor? Grab the microphone. Talk me through how you solved this. Hmm, doesn't seem to be working for Caesar either. Let's try one more here. Andy. Andy, do me a favor. What you're going to do is click on the talk button that's just above everybody's name. Go ahead and click that for me. Talk me through how you solve this. Not the one on the screen. It seems like somebody's actually clicking the picture here. Not this, but the uh, actual talk button up above everybody's name. Oh, that's okay. I don't want to uh, spend that time having somebody type it all the way out, though I appreciate the offer there. Okay, let's talk about how you would actually solve this thing using some algebra and see if anybody did it this way. So, in order to solve this problem, what you would need to do is calculate the actual uh, sum total of all of the scores of the juniors and then calculate the sum total of all of the scores of the seniors, and then divide that new total by the number of juniors and seniors combined. How many of you did it that way? If you did, give me a quick plus one in the chat. Nicely done. If you did that, that is fantastic, really well done, really strong math skills, but actually not the most efficient way to solve this problem. The most efficient way is to cheat off of B. So let me show you finally here what I mean by that. Let's take a look for a second here and say, well, what if, what if the average actually was 90? Without doing a whole lot of math, just looking at the problem here, what do you guys think? Does it make sense that the whole average, the average of both classes together, would be 90? Why not? I mean, obviously, I've got 88 and 92. Divide that by 2, and that's going to give me 90. Why is that no good? Aha. In this example here, where we just took the average, we only had 188 and 192, a single 88 and a single 92. But that's not what we have here. Very good, guys. Nicely done. Yes. So now we consider. What if quantity B is bigger or smaller? If quantity B was too big and the actual average was smaller, that would mean that we would have more juniors down here with 88. If quantity B was too small and the actual average was larger, that would mean we must have had more seniors to pull the average up towards 92. Which one's actually true? Do we have more juniors or seniors? Oh, you guys told me already. We have more juniors. So our actual average must be smaller, and quantity B must be greater. What do you guys think? Have we solved this problem? Do 
Max is on board. What about the rest of you guys? If you like this one, if you follow how we solve this here, give me a quick plus one. Oh, Rajiv, absolutely. And being able to solve this thing algebraically is a really great advantage, too. Um, I will talk you through that at the end of class if you'd like. If anybody's interested to see the actual math solution to this, I'm happy to show you. Just we have a couple other problems that I want to get to here tonight, just practicing this method. So before we do that, Rajiv, yeah, stick around after and I'll show you how that works. Let's try a couple others with the method, though. So let's take a look at this one again. Just like before, what I want you guys to do is think about, hey, what would happen if we said that these, that quantity A and quantity B were equal? There we go. How would we test that? Yeah, absolutely. Let's try just plugging it in. So, who's got a calculator handy? Quick plus one if you got a calculator right there with you. Excellent. Okay, you guys, my uh, my calculator crew here. What happens if we just plug 28 in for G? What is 16 divided by 28? Good. 0.5714. Boop, 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 boop. Good. Okay. Let's try it with the other one. 28 divided by 49. Same thing. Aha. Yes, it is. And when I said same thing, I didn't. I wasn't trying to give you the guys the answer. I actually meant go ahead and try that out on your calculators. But Caesar, you are correct. Not just five seven. Sabrina, give me some more decimals there. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Five, seven, one, four, and so on. These two quantities are equal. So, what does it mean to us that these two were equal? Well, now let's think about this. What if B were too small? What if we made quantity A greater? If quantity A was greater, if G was greater, what would happen to this value? Good. And how about the value over here? What happens to this one? Yeah. This one's going to get smaller because our quantity here would increase and that would make this value smaller this one would increase. Would our two ratios be equal anymore? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What about the other way? And Caesar, I'll ask you to hold off just because you got that one so quickly. What if we made quantity, what if we made G, if we made quantity A, something smaller? Now what happens to this value? Quantity G goes down. What happens with this value? Absolutely. It's going to get bigger. Absolutely. How about this one? Very good. Very good. And so once again, will those two quantities be equal? Excellent. 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 So, what must be true of quantity A and quantity B? Good. 
they've got to be equal. Absolutely. Yep, very good. And our correct answer must be C. You guys all with me on that? Give me a quick plus one if you're on board there. Now, is that the only way to solve this? Absolutely. I have Francisco, if there's nothing wrong with that, that's 100% correct, and that's the mathematical way to solve this problem. That's fantastic. Absolutely. That works. Um, I'm just demonstrating how, even if you didn't see that, even if you didn't understand the formula or understand the algebra there, you could still solve this by cheating off the of page. Does that make sense? Ah, because C square as a solution. Uh, Francisco, we can talk about that a little bit more after class there. We'll get into the weeds with that. I want to stay focused on the strategies for now, but absolutely, I want to come back and address that. Yeah. Sure, Max. So let's imagine a scenario. Let's say, for example, we've done something with a uh, Let's say quantity B had been 27 here to start with. Quantity B isn't 28 anymore. Just for the sake of argument, let's pretend it was 27 instead. If we plug 27 in for G, are these two quantities going to be equal anymore? No, of course not, right? Um, so we can rule out answer choice C. If we try something less than 27, will these two quantities be equal? Nope. Absolutely. So quantity B can't be greater. What if we plug in something greater than 27? Will it make this part true? Or rather, could it make this part true? Very good. So in that case, we would know that the, the answer to solve this problem is greater than 27. And so answer choice A would have to be correct. Does that make sense, Max? Awesome. Okay, cool. Then I want to try this again with another problem. Now you guys know the secret this time. You guys know what I want you to be looking for here. Take a shot at it. I'm going to give you two minutes on the clock. When you think you have your answer, I want you to go ahead and poll it in. Not the chat. Please send it over to me by using the poll function. Now, I'm getting some answers in, but not a ton of them yet. So let me ask you this. By the way, I'm going to set that chat back to public. Please don't chat me your answers. Please send them in using the poll. Please send them in using the buttons. Okay. The chat is back to public, so please come on back to the main room. How many of you started calculating a rate for both Rachel and for Terry? Give me a quick plus one in the chat there if you did it that way. All right, only a handful of you. 
that's a totally valid way to do it. It's going to get you the right answer. That's absolutely fine. How many of you tried to cheat off of B first? Plus one if you did. Good. All right. Cool. I like that. I like that you're starting to notice that. Fantastic. How? How are we going to use B to answer this question? I see somebody type in. How about Catherine? Catherine M. Grab the microphone for me. Talk me through how you did it. Go ahead, give it a shot now, Catherine. Hello. There we go, victory. Hi. Um, so I don't know if this is right. Um, because I did this in the very last like thirty seconds, but I just took it like forty divided by ten to see how many Rachel would make, and then um, forty divided by eight to see how many Perry would make, and got five plus four equals nine. So. That's 4 and 40 divided by 8 is 5. So they would make 9, so it's equal. Or, yeah. Now, why? You mentioned that you did that in the last 30 seconds in particular. I'm going to shut off your mic just for a second there because you're having some feedback. Why was that? Um, I love it. I love the way you solved this. Why did you do that in the last 30 seconds? Grab the mic again. Tell me what else you were doing. Um, I tried initially with the rate formula. Um, so rate equals distance times time, I believe. Um, but then I got a little confused with what exactly is the rate and what's the time and what's the work and kind of got lost in that and then remembered to just, or I was trying to plug in 40 into the rate formula rather than just try to use the information. Does that make sense? Absolutely, that makes sense. And that's, honestly, I couldn't have hoped for a better example, Catherine. So thank you so much for being willing to share that. Yeah, that's exactly my point here. Doing that math would have gotten you to the right answer if you could have gotten it all sorted out and if you could have gotten it done in time. Totally valid way of solving this. And one of the, the difficulties that I run up against when I'm trying to help students learn this strategy is that a lot of my students go, yeah, but what about doing the math? Because it's been so ingrained in us that we have a math problem and then we have to use all these complicated formulas and then our big victory at the end is an answer. How cool is it to be able to take a shortcut instead, to be able to cheat off of B? And it's not even really cheating. I used that word earlier, and that's what the strategy is called. But really, the test makers have given us this value for a reason. They want you to use it strategically, exactly like Catherine did there. And Catherine, how great was that? You solved this problem in 30 seconds once you keyed into the fact that they had left you a clue. Very nicely done. Strong work. Everybody on board with how Catherine solved that? Give me a quick uh, plus one in the chat there if you're with me. And more specifically, if you're with Catherine. Nicely done. And by the way, Catherine, thank you so much for being our first guinea pig to hop on the microphone there. Sorry, we had some technical difficulties with that earlier. Um, but very nicely done, very clearly explained. All right, fantastic. We've got time for one last quick one. And then, like I said, I will be happy to stick around. Ooh, okay. Oh, I got a tough one for you. This one's going to test your logic a little bit here. This one, absolutely, you can solve it with some math. But let's see if you can get the answer to this one by cheating off of B. I'm going to give you two minutes on the clock. Good luck. Oh, when you have your answer, please don't send it to me in the chat. Please use the poll.
Ooh, I've got you guys the tough one. I don't have a lot of answers in, and I'm assuming that's because that is a difficult problem that I've chosen to end with here tonight. Um, if you don't have an answer in yet, I'd be interested to see your best guess. Really quickly, even if you're not sure of it, poll in for me. What is your gut telling you about this problem? Not the chat, the poll, please. All right. I'm going to show you guys how to math through this one, but let's talk about the logic of it first. What would have to, and I'm sending the chat back to public, so please come on back to the main room if you haven't done so yet. What would have to be true for A to equal B? Yeah, it would have to be equal to 55, absolutely. But what would have to be true about the two speeds here? And if you're not sure, think back. Aha, interesting. They would have to have been contributing. Let me rephrase what you guys are saying here because you're on the right track. They would both have to be contributing an equal amount to this speed right here. It would have to be that they were both contributing the same amount to this speed right here. Now, we did take the same route on both these trips, correct? So it's not going to be anything about the distance that changes. Is there any other reason to believe that either one of these would be contributing more? Aha! Francisco, very good. A different time. Which way is going to take longer? Of course, right? That slower speed is going to take longer. And since we spend more time on the trip traveling at this slower speed, where is our average? Grab those highlighters for me. Grab those highlighters for me. Where on this line is our actual speed going to fall? Will it be right in the middle? Will it be above or will it be below? You are correct. You are correct. Because this is contributing more, quantity B must be greater. Nicely done. And I can prove that to you guys with some math, too. Do you guys want to see the math as a proof for this one? Because I know this one's a little bit counterintuitive. Okay. Let's set up a hypothetical here. I'm going to show you guys the easiest way to math this one out. Let's set up a hypothetical here where we've got 300 miles in between points A and B, Amityville and Beetletown there. How many hours does it take us to get from A to B when we're traveling at 50 miles per hour? Good. Great. Times time equals distance. Our distance was 300. Our rate was 50, and therefore our time was 6. Okay, what about B to A? How many hours this time? Good. Our distance is still 300. Our rate this time is 60, and so our time must be 5. How about round trip? A to B and back again. How much time do we spend through the full trip? Good. And how far do we travel? And if you do that math, our rate works out to be 54.54 repeating. That longer time at 50 miles an hour drags that average down. That's the time, guys. Absolutely. Yep. Almost exactly like that problem with student averages. 
That's a problem type called weighted averages that we dive into a lot deeper in the full course. In fact, there's a whole little mini section in one of our lessons where we talk specifically about weighted averages and why they work that way. Speaking of the full course, really quickly, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we have a few classes forming now. Oh, absolutely, Kathy. Great having you here. We've always got classes forming at manhattanprep.com slash GRE slash classes. If you liked what you saw here tonight, and if you'd be interested in taking a class with me in particular, I do have an online class coming up here uh, forming soon. You can check that one out at the link that we've got here on the screen. All right, fantastic, guys. Hey, great working with you all.